Okay. Um, and uh, we are a regional planning organization that uh, provides intergovernmental cooperation, communication, uh, facil and facilitating regional initiatives, including economic development, environmental protection, and water quality um, initiatives. Um, we work with partners to help them address regional problems. And this webinar uh, was established to help planners sharpen their skills as a vehicle for planning board and zoning board of appeal members to obtain credit hours. Town and village uh, zone, zoning board of appeal planning board members, as well as county planning board members must receive four hours of training annually. Municipalities have a wide latitude in defining what training is, is acceptable for credit. So after each webinar in this series, each attendee registered with an email address will receive an email confirming attendance. And this email may be submitted to your municipality for consideration of credit. We wanna thank our sponsor very much, Hodgson and Russ, whose generous support allows us to offer these trainings free of charge. Thank you also to our presenters, uh, the LaBerge Group, for sharing their expertise with all of you. And in addition for practicing AICP certified planners, this session has been approved for one hour of CM credit. And then I just wanna go over a few housekeeping notes. Our attendees join with video and audio off for security purposes. This does not mean that you are unable to ask questions. However, please do so using the Q&A feature um, or ask button at the bottom of your screen. And we will be answering most of the questions towards the end of the presentation. Um, this presentation will be archived as a PDF um, and is being recorded. The link will be shared on our website um, as well as to our YouTube channel. So today's um, uh, webinar topic, short-term rentals, um, will be looking at how short-term rentals are gaining in popularity as a convenient option for vacationers, business travelers, and people seeking a weekend getaway. Unfortunately, perceived and actual impacts on neighborhood community character and the availability of affordable housing continues to grow as well. While short-term rentals may have reinvigorated local tourism market throughout the state, more and more communities are facing an important choice. Should we take a hands-off approach for the benefit of our economy, or should we more strictly regulate, regulate short-term rentals to preserve local community character and keep local residents from being priced out. This session will offer a snapshot of local and regional short-term rental market, positive and negative impact to local communities and how various municipalities have chosen to address the issue. The session will include, conclude with a set of workable suggestions to try, strike a balance between an outright ban and reasonable regulation to preserve local housing market limit neighborhood impacts, boost tourism economies, and provide opportunities for homeowners to supplement their income. And so today we have Nicole Allen, uh, AICP, Director of Planning and Community Development at the LaBerge Group, and Kevin Schwentfier, uh, Senior Planner at the LaBerge Group. Uh, Mrs. Allen manages the planning department and directs all community development projects and staff with more than 20 years of development service experience, sorry, she leverages a deep understanding of the mandates of various funding sources to support the development of compelling application for a range of client projects, including planning, economic development, environmental facilities, infrastructure, and government service initiatives. Ms. Allen regularly leads the development team in weaving together multiple sources of grants and financing to uh, into a cohesive project funding quilt. This approach has been contributed to securing more than $360 million in project funding since 2000. Mr. Schwenfier is a community planning specialist with more than 10 years of experience in regional and local planning and GIS management. His project experience includes the development of comprehensive economic development, special district, and infrastructure master plan. Kevin has provided many local and regional clients with land use regulations and permitting services. 
design guideline, grant writing and administration, and concept plan for site development. In addition to being proficient in digital mapping and all stages of secret review, Kevin has also significant experience in public outreach, committee facilitation, and consensus building. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to Nicole and Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, pull this up. You can see everything, right, Josh? Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and we're excited to be here with you as well. Uh, so today we will run through just kind of a, a quick, um, what is the short-term rental, some of the history, uh, just to familiarize everyone with how long it's really been with us and some of the changes that have occurred, but also looking at current trends, how it, some of the challenges that communities are facing and some of the variation. We'll get into some of the regulatory pitfalls, but then at the end, we'll make sure that we have time for some of the questions to be able to help kind of help you work through some of your more situational um, challenges with the short-term rentals as well. So with that, uh, short-term rentals, you know, what exactly is it? It's It's been an evolving uh, term that's used within communities, but it's really any rental of any part or partial um, component of the dwelling unit. And it can come in a wide variety of uses, whether it be an apartment, it could be a villa, it could be a, a condo, townhouse, cabin, guest house, your mobile home, boat. Um, it's really a portion of the property that's being rented. The key part of it is that it is typically for less than 30 days. It's intended to be a short-term uh, lease low uh, rental e experience that is uh, being offered to the public at large. So it's anyone that can uh, want to take these rentals on. And that's some of the challenge that takes away from we get into the housing aspect of it, because it does then put some of these units up against our, our housing availability, um, as these are kind of flipped on a more frequent basis. As, and we'll get into those challenges. But the key piece is that these type of units are short term, um, and there's very little interaction typically between the host and the and those that are renting it. So the owner of the host doesn't necessarily have to be available and hand off keys anymore. The way that these rentals have evolved, they're they're very um, high end in the sense that uh, that interaction doesn't have to happen and, and as part of the process anymore. So. As part of the history, though, these aren't a new phenomenon, and they've been a part of the traditional process that communities have experienced. Uh, homeowners throughout the years have been renting their homes or portions of their homes for economic reasons, being able to find opportunity to either market or leverage their own resources. Uh, they just have changed and evolved in the sense of how they are now booked and the ease of how you are able to book and rent these and market these uh, short-term rentals to the community is what really has kind of exploded nationally and, and made some of the challenges that a lot of the communities are facing as these become much and more frequent um, as part of the fabric that we have. I'm gonna let Kevin dive into the history here. Sorry, I was, already, I was already there, sorry. <laughs> Hi, so um, yeah, so while dozens of uh, online platforms uh, do exist throughout the internet and the world, um, there are a few top players that we're, we all know and utilize. Um, I would typically ask at this point in a live session, how many people have either you know, own a short-term rental, have rented short-term rentals, or at least have, you know, a family member who you utilize their short-term rental. And it's it's usually the majority. It just shows that these are, these these websites and these services really integrated into our lives at this point. Um, and people in a lot of cases um, have uh, replaced this or are utilizing this in, um, instead of the typical accommodations route. Um, so for a, a quick history, VRBO was the first one to do this. They were founded in 1995, if you can believe it, to actually start this kind of a platform uh, for the first online booking platform. 
Um, but it wasn't until the one that we all know was, which is Airbnb, really took this to the next level um, because they are the ones that just, you know, open the floodgates that you didn't need. You could open, you could rent a room in someone's house. You you could share a room with somebody that you don't even know. It it um, it it really brought this into the, you know, obviously the 21st century. Um, and as Nicole said, this this there was there the the traditional rental uh, operations are still active, um, both uh, in renting seasonally, and even hotels uh, who are starting to take on um, their own online platforms to, to try to compete with this. Thank you. Uh, so continuing on, uh, municipalities have the authority to regulate short-term rentals under the police powers of town law. Um, so this was um, in, in New York State, um, that is now over 10 years old, uh, the ability for the towns to regulate these just like any other use. Um, it's been more recent where towns are actually catching up and putting these laws into practice because they've it's it's taken a while for certain regulatory issues to pop up where they feel the need to um, enact this. It also um, create, you know, beyond just regulatory, you can uh, do a permitting. So the town board may permit and otherwise regulate hotels and boarding houses, rooming houses, lodge houses, associations, clubs, or any other building or part of a building used in the business for renting a rooms. That is across the board. So <laughs> everything's covered under the, uh, the, the, the state law uh, in order for you, you and your municipality to actually regulate these just as you would regulate any other use. And this, you know, obviously hotel accommodation use. Right. And you might see these in various town codes um, as part of the zoning law, but there may also be a separate chapter. Um, so town under town law or under under village law, either way. Uh, so it could be a chapter that is zoning and it could be a chapter that is more on the permitting process or licensing process that occurs that would be a separate chapter under town or village code. So over the last 15 years or so, the uh, online companies have really been able to scale this whole thing up, um, the res you know resort style rental model uh, into the mainstream uh, world. Um, so we're talking about urban areas, suburban areas, rural areas, as well as those um, seasonal areas. Um, it's what people really enjoy about these is that is how customizable they are to your needs. Um, that's what really sets this apart from the traditional hotel model. Um, you can literally, obviously, go in. You can choose all of your parameters. You can find that place that fits what you're looking for. Um, it gives people that independence, maybe that they're looking for, where you know that you don't actually have to deal with a staff. You don't have to. You, you still have service in place, but you know you you still have control, as if you were just going to your own home. Um, and of course, this you know, level of change and is uh, is challenging for, for communities when something suddenly takes off like this, especially for those resort communities um, to keep up with. Um, and many challenges have come as, um, as a result of this, which is why probably most of you are here. Um, we're, I mean, we're talking about P, uh, a huge influx of people that could come into your community on a seasonal basis or on uh, an annual basis that you your community maybe just wasn't designed for or or you don't have the regulatory structure to deal with uh, from code enforcement from um, trash pickup um, et cetera and or and not necessarily just at the community level it could go as micro as a neighborhood or a, a street yes. level as well that it just wasn't designed for the frequency that some of the short-term rentals bring as they transition from new user to new user uh, and some of the, the noise and other challenges that come along and, with it. And breaking up some traditional neighborhoods that were maybe longtime um, owners who actually lived there to now every other house not having a constant transition of 
uh, transient folks. Uh, so this, I, I, I touched on this a little bit ago, uh, hotel companies and other property management um, companies are starting to capitalize on the short-term rental market. They're, you know, you can go onto Airbnb and find something hosted by um, a subsidiary of um, Marriott or um, uh, Hilton. And so that that's, that's more in urban markets at this point. Uh, that hasn't really gotten going in the more rural suburban areas, but I just assume it's coming because um, they're they're missing out on that revenue just as much as they're they're being affected by the, that that lack of revenue just as much as communities are as well <laughs> because these are basically unregulated um, commercial uses. But it also allows uh, property owners to use a hotel as part of their own management process, so they yes. become more like property management that can then. If they're away, they could be absentee landlords or, or owners, and then they were able to have a hotel come in and be able to kind of manage the upkeep mm -hmm. and make sure that the sheets are turned down for the next renter. So it does change the dynamics quite a bit by bringing in the, the larger hotel into this industry. It does. And what we're really trying to do with regulations is make sure that these places are being run in a professional manner with a professional property manager. Um, so this is one option that can help with that. So here are some of the current challenges. There's many challenges, um, noise, traffic, competition, uh, local comp economic competition, uh, trash, trespassing on uh, neighboring properties, uh, safety concerns, and um, of housing, but a lot of this is, affor is affordable housing that we keep running into as a challenge where uh, where communities don't, are running out of their affordable housing stock or the prices of these short-term rentals are driving uh, real estate costs higher, which then um, takes away from the affordability of that housing if that wasn't happening. Right. Some of the housing is getting uh, bought up so that it can serve just the short-term rental purpose. Uh, typically by by second homeowners that don't necessarily live there, but are looking for an opportunity for some economic return. And that does put a strain on being able to find a long-term rental housing opportunity uh, at the same competitive price. So we're just, just going to run through the, the few of the different challenges uh, based on the, the type of community that you're in at this point. Um, so seasonal communities tend to have a higher percentage of short-term rentals than suburban bedroom communities. Uh, they contend with parking, noise, trash events, and infrastructure issues on a much larger scale. Um, you know, if, if you've been to the Jersey Shore, you kind of know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or if you've been to Hunter in the winter or Lake Placid, um, you know, any, any of those seasonal communities that just get inundated in the summer, um, then they're already dealing with that level, but having this people stay in places or utilize places that weren't set up as commercial areas, uh, kind of, you know, that 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 makes it not just Main Street's problem, or it make you know it it, it can affect the uh, entire community, as we said, with within the neighborhoods, um, with even within the the you know some of the surrounding um, recreational areas. Um, that you know maybe this wasn't uh, weren't designed for that level of impact um we also have um an inadequate supply of owner occupied housing and uh rental properties um in those places um because the population the year round populations tend to be much much smaller um so those folks are the ones that end up getting the uh you know paying for the cost of this because you, without these being regulated or taxed um, as other business, uh, commercial entities, um, there's no way to capture the, that those impact costs. Uh, rural communities have a uh, issue of population increases per unit with large scale events. So we're talking about a lot of like weddings, barn weddings, or um, you know, large homes that people can support a ton of folks on just based on the size of the property alone. Some people are bringing you know 
they'll rent these out, have people bring their campers and their tents. And, you know, suddenly you have a hundred people on, on a property that's, you know, that's a 2000 square foot house with a barn. Um, they may, uh, yeah, so they, they'll allow for well over reasonable ratios. These types of units will also tend to uh, overtax the private well and septic systems so that can cause an environmental issue uh, within these communities that have really not had to deal with any any much infrastructure impacts um, when they're, they're these really rural communities. Obviously, this isn't every single one of these uh, rental properties, but it just tends to happen more in these in places that have you know little land use regulation experience. So um, it just becomes an easier target for that kind of abuse. Suburban communities, uh, they're more likely to have conflicts. Uh, the, the neighborhoods, the, the residential neighborhoods, especially if they're zoned single family uh, development or single family or two family. Um, places that are, have had a history of very tight knit uh, neighborhoods where you know the you know you know your neighbors, your kids walk to school together. Um, there they they there's both a seen and perceived um, impact here. Uh, the high rate of transient users, you know, they, they create concerns over safety, noise, uh, trespassing, trash, um, and again the potential for the human the uh, infrastructure impacts. Um, Suburban communities, although don't typically have the scale of short-term rentals as other areas, mainly because you have a much higher rate of owner-occupied housing. Um, so, it, but it actually tends to stand out more when one of these does turn into that, in, especially one that's always a short-term rental, because um, people, you know, it's that it's that village voice suddenly is uh, has that concern over that one or two uh, properties. So it's just really good to have strong regulations in place in order to allow for this. Um, this is also could come into the zoning side of things where maybe certain places in your community aren't, aren't meant to have short-term rentals, um, and this could be one of them. Uh, urban communities. Uh, tend to have a greater number of mixed use areas where short term rentals tend to conflict less. Um, but not, but even saying that, if you live in an apartment complex and one of your apartment the apartments is always rented as a short term, you could have the same issues as a suburban community. Um, here you get more also more impact for business owners who are competing for short term rental um, uh, clientele. Um, you know you're. The hotels are looking for a level playing field, basically. Um, the hotels ends, it could be, you know, any of those um, on that next list below. But yeah, uh, bed, and, bed and breakfast is one that I think has been impacted a lot because um, I do see less of those in, uh, in the world suddenly. Um, it seems to be harder for them to maintain a, a solid uh, rental base. Um, so, and seasonal rental agencies are starting to get, get disadvantaged, um, because of the online, the ease of the online presence of these companies versus, uh, their maybe possibly antiquated systems of, um, mouth to mouth or phone or however they do it now. <laughs> um, you go there we go. Okay. So the why. So I like to say that you should only enact regulations if there is an actual, if there's something you're actually trying to regulate, there's an actual problem that you're trying to solve. Um, that being said, regulation can come in many forms. A regulation could just be a permit. If you're just looking to capture funds, then to help uh, alleviate some of these costs, then a, a, a simple permit could just be the answer without actually having to do much in the way of regulation. But if you're having issues within your community where you are seeing these, you know, trash or um, the overpopulation of these houses for rentals, um, if if people aren't, are, you know, aren't respecting the community, then th that's the really the true regulatory side of this. Um, that's where you, you really want to have a strong 
uh, law in place that says how these should, what, what the proper way to set up a short-term rental is, who can use it, or how many people can use it, um, what, what, you know, what number of cars can be on that property, what constitutes a bedroom, you know, get, you know, the, and some of this is basic um, code enforcement stuff. Like you can't have a bedroom that has zero windows and you have to walk through a hall, you know, you have to walk through to get to another bedroom. Um, it, or you can't have a bedroom that's only five feet by five feet. Or, <laughs> um, you know, so, some of these basic things of just design and functionality um, can really be incorporated into a regulation. Um, so regulations uh, can, you know, can create an economic benefit, as you probably also will admit that short-term rentals can and may be creating an economic benefit to some communities. Um, but that economic benefit should be balanced with um, the municipality and, you know, between the, the property owner and the municipality, uh, there sh one shouldn't be making out while the other is getting, uh, is it's detriment to the other. Um, so mutually beneficial is the way to go. If we want this to be a, uh, if, if you want to stay out of conflict. Right. And some of looking at that, um, from a different perspective is on, uh, looking at the percent of vacant, homes you have and your rental housing, just to see what percent you have. Um, as that number goes down and your short-term rentals go up, that's where you start to see some of the affordability pinches as well in making sure that your regulations are appropriately sized for your community to be able to manage those challenges. Um, so no matter which type of community you're in, uh, short-term rentals are primarily taxing to local code enforcement. Um, if you're having those issues. Um, so without regulation, code enforcement lacks any true power in dealing with these types of uses outside of just general property maintenance code, um, noise ordinance, which are very hard to enforce. Um, with a regulation, um, code enforcement is often the front line for compliance. In some communities, this task can become actually burdensome because you don't have a large staff for code enforcement, but that can be passed on through funds you've collected to a third party um, entity to help with that. Or it, you could actually bolster your enforcement capacity through those, those added funds where you, you know, get a full-time code enforcement officer, maybe with a couple part-time, or you get, a, you know, you get a larger department that can actually manage um, those issues, depending on the level of issues you're dealing with in your, in your right. community. And as you, you build your short term rental uh, list or inventory within your community. They can be part of a process where your code enforcement officers can uh, create kind of a schedule for how they're going to uh, evaluate them, kind of similar to your multifamily homes, to make sure that they're meeting fire compliance and other other key issues that you want to make sure are explored for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, some definitions uh, the court. So for regulatory issues, uh, the courts have sided with the owner of a rental property when the definition is unclear and uh, clearly meant for outdated issues. Um, so make sure that what you're actually putting together um, creates stronger language if needed in your uh, zoning or land use regulation or whatever you're gonna put together. And, Sorry. and by that, Kevin means uh, as far as when you're defining what is a short-term rental or if you just have a dwelling unit, a dwelling unit that doesn't depend what a short-term rental is can be rented. And many homeowners assume they have the right to rent it, whether it's yearly, monthly, right. Um, right. weekly. So th that's where it really needs to be very clearly defined or it will go in the favor of the homeowner. Right. Thank you. That's yep. choking. <laughs> um. Inspections. So uh, Nicole had mentioned that inspections could be part of this. Uh, an inspection could be as much as going and doing an exterior, just making sure that what was put on um, a quick site plan made sense with where people could park and where the entrances were. Or it can be a full um, fire code inspection on every one of these properties, um, making sure that people that you do have legal rooms, bedrooms, you have the number of bathrooms, you have 
um, fire protection equipment uh, with sprinklers the could be required within, depending on the yeah, number of bedrooms. The size of the yep. facility, yes. Um, so vi uh, violations, though, uh, could be difficult to discern if um, you're only relying on um, complaints. So that's one reason why the inspection it could is a could be a positive for your community because then you actually have somebody who's gone and seen what's actually going on in that place because you know complaints from neighbors could be you know have nothing to do with actually what's happening on that site they could just have a grudge with that neighbor over the years that they're just trying to uh keep going uh or so making sure that the town has a baseline for what's going on at these properties and not just relying on word of mouth is really important uh, noise ordinances are historically difficult to enforce and measure. Some communities have hired um, third party folks or equipment to actually measure noise at property boundary lines. This is this is really time consuming if if you have um, a community where the, this is happening at, with a lot of frequency. Um, so tread lightly on what constitutes a noise violation and if you're actually going to put noise as an issue as a regulatory issue in your re uh, regulation um then policing powers and monitoring um is generally in smaller communities very limited um sometimes you have the county who designates one vehicle per day for you know not of even 24 hours so if all these things are happening at night then it, but you also want people not speeding during the day how do you balance that out um so compliance based on policing is is probably not going if you're relying on police to be the ones that are going to be the enforcement of this that it probably won't work because they're not going to have that full-time presence especially not every single corner of your community where this could be taking place Um, so we kind of talked about, um, issues of parking and trash. I like to use those because these are things that can really get down to, um, how regular, how you could set your regular regulation up, um, for parking of the park, if parking or overpopulation is an issue, then setting a limit to the number of vehicles based on the number of beds or bedrooms within that, um, unit. Um, would, is a great tool, I, and I think that's a, just a great tool in general, um, because it also keeps um, the property in check from, you know, yes, these five people rented this place, but then, hey, they wanted to invite a bunch of people up for the night, and suddenly you have a party that's <laughs> taken over this property that might be disrupting your, uh, that, that neighborhood. Um, so then at any, you know, you can say it, you can either set like no overnight guests, no, no, you know, you have to have, you can only have this number of people based, you know, for, after this time of day. Um, but the, the actual setting an actual limit to the people in these units is, is very, very important to help keep those problem, um, properties at bay, uh, trash. Uh, I like I, I like the trash thing because I know up in the village of Hunter they're having major issues where um, units would just hire a dumpster company to come and drop dumpsters off in front of the houses. So you'd have an entire street <laughs> lined with dumpsters, right, almost right in the roads. Um, having an actual trash enclosure for for these facilities or that have to be sighted off the roads with a, a fence around it um you know if you're having trash problems that's the best route to go is to actually have that as part of this law to say like you can't have this unless you can show that there is not going to be an issue of trash because you've provided this space this way of picking this you know collecting that trash um and this level of screening. Uh, the permit process. So I mentioned the collection of fees, um, would which will provide enforcement funding, um, is a great mechanism. Um, and then it 
also providing a the permit also provides a mechanism of uh, consequence. So, you know, if if you don't obviously if you know you, a bunch of places have to have all these places have to have a permit in order to operate, but then somebody starts operating without a permit, and then they get fined. It, it gives it gives you an, them an incentive to get that permit. Um, it gives the community the ability to have a consequence towards these bad actors. And, and, you know, some people might sign up not, you know, on a Airbnb or another website who they don't, you know, maybe they don't know that the community has this permitting process in place. Um, those, you know, historically, um, but then once this else, you know, once you get that regulation in place, suddenly if, if let's say you need to get a permit, an annual permit, Airbnb if no will know that that has to happen in for your particular community. They will work with communities on that. Um, and therefore they, they will put that this uh short-term rental property does not have a permit, a re the required permit. Um, they can put it right on their posting or they can take their posting down based on that. Um, so it does become um some somewhat of a regulatory partner in uh, keep, keeping these your permitting process going so permit regulations could include as we mentioned parking and trash but also occupancy limitations building code compliance fire code compliance zoning specific regulations so certain zones if if you have zoning in your community um, could either allow or disallow or have a different level of um, short-term rental requirements per zone. Um, there could be an annual rental day cap. So throughout the year, you could only rent this property for a certain number of days total. Um, guest registration or registry information, local contact person, really important. Um, not in contact and uh, maintenance person. Um, having uh, signage, signage should be something that was put into the regulation. Can't, you know, you, you can't be, you know, you can't have like a sign like Hilton right in front of your house, but you also need to have some signage that set, that shows that you, this is a business of some kind. Um, and, and giving people an easy way to find these locations. Um, fencing, um, screening, uh, nuisance law adherence, and in some cases, HOA rules, which then gets, becomes another regulatory animal because some HOAs will strictly outlaw this or they'll take over the entire regula regulation of these. Right. So finding a clear path on how those uh, permits uh, blend together is, is a key component, mm -hmm. making sure that uh, find, being able to locate that local contact is an important part of the both from the renter's perspective, but also from the enforcement perspective. And so I think some of those key issues have to be kind of worked through in the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so here's, I like, this is just like basic, the basic permit. If I was setting up a permit, um, that a uh, person who's applying would have to disclose the number of beds, the number of bedrooms that meet minimum state code, that's 70 square feet, number of parking spaces, uh, for the you know legal parking spaces, uh, total square feet of rental units of the entire rental unit, uh, provision for waste removal, and that they are in compliance with fire safety, the New York fire safety. Um, so basically, no matter even if you just want a you know a basic permit where you're just collecting money for their operation. Um, you still should collect this, at least this minimum level of information, just so that you have something to go on if if a complaint or violation does, or some kind of violation does take place. Um, you know, th this is this is no really no different than a lot. You know, what you would be getting in site plan review. Um, you would, you know, they would have to disclose how many, you know, what what can this facility support how does your parking make sense do you have adequate square footage um how how are you going to get rid of your garbage you know all all you know and and you obviously go can go beyond that you know it, this this it, this in, in itself is a separate use especially you know 
for those utilizing zoning. Um, so they you can have them go through a full site plan review if you would like this to be a separated use. But if you don't have that, or if you don't want to include this in your zoning, then I would still try to collect at least this level of information on a permit farm. Right. And then similarly, uh, just or to add on the fire safety piece too, um, a way to protect your, your yourself, your liability as a community too, is making sure that that fire safety compliance is a responsibility of the property owner yeah. to be able to make sure that they have the uh, whether sprinklers are required, but even to make sure that there's a, a fire extinguisher on on site, that they have the emergency exits noted, or that there's a fire plan put in place so that people do know how to exit the the building. Yeah, and similar to even in your own house, you want to have fire extinguisher, you want to have um, uh, alarms. You maybe need to have a ladder out of high window. You right. know, do this the exact. That Same people are not being going to be trapped in a basement yeah, exactly. or, or other extreme. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, there's an actual exit from the basement. Right. <laughs> um, so we already kind of touched on this um, inspections, building inspections, state fire code inspections. Um, could be both could be desirable for community um, or not based on the level of uh, regulation you want to uh, incorporate. Um, local occupancy taxes. So a lot of um, counties have bed taxes, not all, um, but any municipality in New York can also have their own local occupancy tax. Um, that's counties, towns, cities, villages. Um, property owners would be required to register with a county treasurer office or some other designated person at a more local level. Uh, would must collect and remit the tax per guest stay to the county to that person. Um, and short term rentals are subject to these laws, and the municipal uh, regulation should include uh, registration as a requirement of a permit. Um, so it shouldn't to be like this shouldn't be separate from uh, the permit regulation. Um, you shouldn't hope that they just go to the county if that's if it's not a local localized uh operation um integrating this into if, if you'd like to go this route um really helps to with the um recapturing of funding um and and putting these types of accommodations on the same level as um your your traditional accommodations um a few other minimum requirements for a permit would be cost of a permit should directly correlate to the housing unit dimensions um, and should be sufficient to cover impacts and personnel costs um so meaning you know oh yeah we want to have another code enforcement officer be hired and make sure that you have enough first have enough uh, short term rentals happening in your community that can cover that. Uh, if you don't, then that probably isn't the right route. Uh, but also make sure that um, you're balancing. You're, you're not so you make sure that what you're charging is not you're not undercharging. Um, a lot of times communities get a little scared when they have to charge a certain you know they go get up to like a thousand dollars for a permit, but. Oh, so you have to realize what what is the average cost of a single night people are paying for one of these units and realize that your permit fee is still going to be a small percent of their overall revenue on an annual basis. So um, I would say in some places, if this isn't causing a massive problem, that those fees don't need to be um, astronomical but if you're in a, a resort community and people are used to spending you know a lot of money per night just to sp stay in a resort community that's really where those costs should be covered at this at the same rate um in order to provide that additional level of security to the municipality who is, can become inundated uh on a seasonal or annual basis and just to add, yeah. those fees uh, should not be built into your zoning language or your permit language. They should be a fee schedule that 
the town or village city uh, reviews on an annual basis, and then you can update them and adopt them um, if they need to have increases on an annual yeah. basis as well. Yeah. So just keep that in mind that it should be examined and then modified as necessary. Yeah. The, yeah so the regulation is one side of this, and then the permitting would be a, a separate right. entity. But keep um, your fee schedule completely yeah. separate from all of those. Absolutely. And, and um, on, on just on that note quick, that not only should that be reviewed annually, but you can review your law annually or your, and your regulation annually. Maybe you, at a certain, maybe somebody, maybe a community wants to have a cap placed on the number of uh, short-term rentals within their community or within a certain zone. And at the end of a year, you realize, well, that cap's either too low or too high and you want to adjust. So keep, make sure, realize that this can be an ongoing um, process. Right. And I would just kind of caution on the caps as well as yeah. far as um, other people may find that to be potentially a taking if they don't have the same rights within a district. Um, and so just yeah. there, some communities have gone to an annual lottery um, right. as far as numbers so that it is uh, kind of a bit more of a fair system. So there are some exploring, exploration that can happen as far as looking at what those limits can be. But then there's also the monitoring it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, monitoring. Great. <laughs> like you know. Um, so compliance monitoring services are a, a major way that you can do all of this without um, putting an additional tax on the community, on your municipality. Uh, so this would be a service. This is a you know private company that would get all the information for, compile all the information for you on where these short-term rentals are, on a and the changes to your short term rental list on a weekly or monthly basis, depending on what you would like. The permit fees could, you know, obviously be adjusted to capture the costs associated with this service. And these services services um, can also be the ones that sent if there's a violation, they send that out. If there is any notification, they could be the ones to send that out. They would send that, but also contact the local municipality. Uh, stating that these this unit is out of compliance, so that then local um, enforcement could take charge on that. They could also be the ones that people um, that folks would send their um, complaints to, um, or, or violations. If they, if someone sees a violation, then this would be a way that they can. Um, this would be a way that they can say this is the violation that I saw. Um, and the mechanism for that would be that you know neighboring your all the neighbors around this would uh, this unit would also would have information about that unit that they could then say well they uh, clearly they have you know fourteen cars when they're only permitted for four or something like right. that um, so they would actually have something to point to. Uh, so a quick state uh, case study, um, which has been an ongoing saga, is the North Elba and Lake Placid uh, joint law. So the two, so Lake Placid is a village within the town of North Elba. Um, they decided they they work together on a lot of their land use um, codes. Um, obviously, a highly resort centric community uh, has a, have a lot of short term rental properties. Um, and they just they were having a lot of issues with their um, what's wrong? with their uh, neighborhoods not feeling like they were intact anymore and getting inundated with um, short term rentals rather than and not having places for people to purchase or live um, affordably. Um, so they. So they wanted to so the, the regulation of the short-term rentals versus comprehensive registration licensing was kind of their starting point um they decided to they needed to balance um within the entirety of the community where short-term rentals can be what level of impact they can have on a district by district basis um, if you are a year-round resident versus an um, absentee landlord, you have different regulations in place now. Um, 
so they 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 had a this 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 law is probably the strictest law you're going to see. So if you look at this law and then pull pull away strip away from it, it would probably fit anybody <laughs> if you would like to, to do it that way. But um, just to know that this is not the norm. This this is these guys really went um, above and beyond what most communities probably need. Um, but at the same time, if you're a, a strict you know if you're a big resort community you might want to look at at least part of what they're doing here. Right. They've really thought through a lot of the challenges they, and some yeah. of the problems that they've, uh, that have occurred. Yeah. Um, we'll have Kevin run through it just real quick. Yeah. I'm going to go quick so that we have time for questions, yeah. which is why I was kind of yeah. <laughs> eating my words there. <laughs> um, so their definition, uh, a dwelling unit that is rented in whole or in part to any person or entity for a period of less than 30 consecutive nights and includes any residential buildings or apartments, single or two family dwellings, condos, townhouse, guest house, cottage cabin, or accessory dwelling, which is rented as a living quarters with kitchen for any period less than 30 consecutive nights. Uh, very, very much at the or on the first slide, I believe, uh, Nicole mentioned what uh, a definition of a short term rental. That definition can change based on any on your community on your law. You can you can define it however you want. If you don't want condominiums to be part of this, then you can take that away. Uh, if you only if if you know if you only want to say single two family dwellings, like you can do that as well. But um, so just know that you have the flexibility to create whatever that definition is. There right. is not one strict definition. Same with if you don't want uh, RVs and, and tenting to be right. included, those right. those type of elements can be excluded. Um, in this in this, this case, rooming and boarding houses have been excluded. Um, um, this is their checklist. So it's I, I, I think a checklist is great. It's a really quick way to say if a uh, rent, a applicant has given you all of the information necessary for them to get that permit. Um, in this case, you can see the, you know, this is their, you know, just the general things that they need in order to get that permit. Application requirements, I'm not going to read through all this. This is a lot, but some of the highlights, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, number of half bathrooms, um, number of parking spaces, uh, municipal water versus private water well. Um, in some inspection reports, um, then they have, they do have a county tax law. So then they also want to know that you've got, uh, registered with the county occupancy tax program. Then maximum occupancy, they have this formula that they set up in order to do that. Um, not always necessary to break it out to this degree, but, um, the occupancy, I'm mean, gonna. It's a little off topic here, but occupancy can also, um, you can you can structure your permitting. If you know if it's only a two bedroom unit, then maybe you could say that that a permit for a two bedroom unit is less than a permit for a six bedroom unit, or you know you could set a tiered system of how much um, someone would have to pay based on what your yeah. reasonable cost would I'll be. I'll just flip to but that yeah, slide real fast. There's an example yeah, of how perfect. some of that structure has been put in place. Yeah. Uh, so everyone will receive a, or have access to the PowerPoint. There's a couple more slides that just talk about uh, a bit more of specifics to uh, Lake Placid. But at this time, I'd love to open it up to some questions. And we're pretty close to the... Yeah, that, that's basically the end. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Didn't realize that was here. Thank you, Nicole and Kevin. Um, so if anyone does have any question they would like answered, uh, feel free to uh, write it in the chat or in the Q&A, and I can... Uh, relay that uh, method to uh, Nicole and Kevin. And if something comes in after the fact um, to you, you can feel free to email us and we'll be happy to respond as well. Um, I do have an email here. Um, is it L-S-I-F-T-I-T-E-S -S -E at LaBerge? Is that correct? Uh, that uh, why don't you use Nalen N A L L E N? I think that would go that goes to our uh, Lucy, which is our marketing director. Uh, can you uh, spell that again? Sorry. Uh, for Nicole Allen, just use oh. N Allen. Okay, got it. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah, I'll just put that in the chat so everyone. Perfect. Has
I'm just going to share uh, my screen really quick, if that's okay, Nicole and Kevin. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Okay. I can. Yeah, um, the, the, the short term rentals is definitely one that's evolving and there are lots of examples out there as you start to explore those options, but it's definitely one that mm -hmm. as the industry continues to change those regulations are being updated on an annual basis with a lot of communities. Yeah. Yeah, all different types of communities, some that have a small number, but are concerned that it's going to grow or that are concerned that it's causing um, their communities to change, but at, all the way up to the seasonal communities that are and some, inundated. Right. And some are even looking at uh, other elements of it, like the, the weddings and some of yeah. the other components that get added on to these short-term rentals too. And the state's looking at the affordable housing issue uh, as a whole um, based on this. Hey, well, thank you so much, guys, for your time and, and covering this uh, interesting topic um, as it becomes a more evolving um, issue in, in uh, today's um, uh, uh, issue in, in town, villages, and cities alike. Um, I do just want to thank uh, Nicole and Kevin again for their time today uh, in their busy schedule and, and all the attendees for taking the time to uh, attend our spring planning and zoning webinar series. We will continue this uh, every Wednesday until May 10th, which is the last session. As you can see on the screen, the next session will be next week covering the circular economy presented by the Christ Christopherson Center. A recording of this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel and our cdrpc.org website under news and events. A reminder that the session was submitted for uh, AICP CM credit for one hour, and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.